turning it over to um, Hung Lee, who is really the master in asking three quarters questions and really creating a community of contributors, um, really wanting to be part of how are we uncovering what needs to be done in the world of work and what is our particular role within that. So Hung, so excited to have you here. I appreciate you being willing to do a presentation for me. Total added bonus. Totally. Um, my pleasure, Liz. Happy to, uh, to ha really happy to be here. And sorry that my face is frozen there. It looks a bit weird. Um, but um, but yeah, ready to roll with this and very happy to have a chat with the folks in the L&D community. I want to just basically go and flick through these slides and get, get on with it, right? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, all right, everybody. Um, firstly, um, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you being uh, here with me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here um, and talking about something I, I'm very passionate about, particularly um, the concept of, you know, how can you be more effective and efficient in this very hard task of looking for work? Um, uh, you know, it's one of the most stressful things anybody can do. Uh, we don't voluntarily go and do it. Um, uh, we oftentimes are involuntarily uh, sort of in this position um, and it can be, you know, tough, high stress, difficult type of experience. So what I want to do is share with you a few things that I've learned on the way as a job seeker, as a recruiter, as a person that's basically tried to ask people for opportunities um, and hopefully share a few ideas that maybe you could implement um, and, uh, and, and for your own sort of situation right now uh, to help you get um, more efficiently better opportunities. So quick one uh, about me, my name is Hong Lee. Um, I've basically been a recruiter for about 20 years or so. So I've been an agent, I've been an in-house guy, I've worked as a head of talent for a bunch of tech companies. Um, I've trained recruiters. Um, I've set up a m number of failed businesses. I've set up a number of businesses that have been okay, um, including a technology business. Um, and most latterly, I've been working in a kind of different fashion, essentially being a community type person, um, talking to tens of thousands of recruiters worldwide in terms of what the current trends are, how people can get better, how can we improve the candidate experience and so forth. Um, and it's from all of that learning that I'm, I've, I've kind of distilled a few thoughts that I want to share with you uh, today. Um, the reason, by the way, I say all of that intro is not to kind of give myself any kind of ego boost, um, but really to give a little bit of a space because what I'm about to say may cause you to think this is crazy talk. Um, you know, what are you talking about? Um, this doesn't seem to make sense. Um, uh, but I wanted to for you to sit on some of those things that I'm going to suggest and, and I'll try and explain why they may make uh, sense and actually may, may make uh, a difference in terms of your experience of the job search. Um, so the topic of the title of the talk is called Be Open With Your Journey. Uh, and the fundamental premise is, is that I think that um, one of the things that we do when we're looking for work and looking for job opportunities is that we're almost always doing things in a very closed and private way. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you have the experience, but oftentimes, you know, the first time I find out that a friend is uh, looking for work or being on the job market is when I see a status update on LinkedIn and it's like, oh, you know, X and Y has got a new job at ABC. Um, and that was the first I knew of it. It's like, oh, that was a surprise. But obviously this had been a project for this person uh, for several weeks, maybe months prior to that. Um, uh, we kind of want to keep a lot of our plans private until sort of such a time where we're able to say, okay, this has actually happened, and we then go ahead and announce it. And I think the psychology is actually really interesting to explore why we do that, um, because, you know, why would we want to advertise a potential failure? Um, uh, you know, would it make sense for me to tell you about my huge plans that, you know, if I fail, maybe that's egg on my face, and, you know, I don't necessarily want to broadcast that. Um, so I think we're all familiar with that, that kind of mentality and, and is, you know, very in, in, we intuitively understand it. Um, and basically what I'm trying to say to you over the next 20 minutes is I believe that that is actually one of the biggest mistakes we make when we're looking to um, discover opportunities. Um, when we're closed and we do things in a private, bilateral way, um, it's one of the most inefficient ways for us to generate opportunities. 
Um, and when I look back on my career, um, uh, all of the times in which um, sort of I have struggled and I've failed and, you know, spent too long as pursuing opportunities, really just burning my morale, burning my energy, pursuing dead ends. And um, that's typically when I have been closed um, and I haven't allowed opportunity to emerge. Um, the times when I have succeeded um, and things have gone well, I've almost always mapped to a different attitude where I've gone forward with an open posture and been much more receptive to new ideas coming forward. In other words, just being a little bit more courageous, courageous earlier in declaring what I'm doing. So I think when we look at the job search, most of the activities we do default to being private. Um, again, if you just think about all of the things that you're doing now, I assume a lot of you might be looking for work at this point or investigating career options or what have you. Probably a lot of that work is pretty private. Um, uh, you know, it's the, the research you're doing, the, the applications you're sending out, the interviews you're having even, uh, the networking people are telling you to do. It's all kind of like um, not publicized. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, I think, a big part of the reason why, uh, why it can be very tough. What I'm going to suggest to you over the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so is that we should experiment with shifting things to, to a public setting and then seeing what happens. Um, so I've picked up four kind of um, uh, common things that, uh, uh, that all of us do in the job search. Uh, you know, writing CVs, resumes, um, re researching opportunities, um, networking with other people in the industry, you know, and assessing or validating your skills in the marketplace. And I'm going to just say, sort of ask you to join me in a thought experiment. Um, and on the one hand, we're going to look, OK, what does it look like if I did those things privately, as is the default? And then let's shift it to the public setting. And how does it look when we do things publicly? And I'll have a few examples to show you, which I think can illustrate some of the points I'm making. So let's go to the first one. Um, resume, writing CVs, resumes. Probably this is something most of us have done in, recently over the last you know, year or so. You know, we're at a, a career summit, so presumably we've spent and invested a bit of time putting together our resume. Think about how we've done that. Chances are it's a very private experience. We've dug out a historical resume from somewhere. We've re-edited it. We've added sort of our last bit of experience. We've kind of tried to format the, uh, the, uh, the document and freshen it up maybe, do those various things, um, generally speaking, by ourselves. Um, at most, we might have sent it to one or two people, friends in our industry, that we say, hey, listen, can you QA this document for me? Make sure that I haven't missed anything. Can you proofread it? Can you do those types of things? And those friends might be generous enough to, uh, of course, help you with that. Um, some of some of us might have actually got out external help. You know, there's people that write resumes, coach resume writing and stuff like that. Maybe some of those folks actually are providing services at this conference today. Great sort of uh, feature of the industry that there is this type of support. Um, but again, um, it's going to be down to a limited number of people um, uh, who have seen and helped us write this resume. Right, um, it's going to be a handful at most. Now, what happens if we decide to shift the uh, mold, our mindset, away from this private way of writing resumes and shift it to public? What does that mean? What does it mean to write a CV or a resume publicly? This is what I meant before when I said oh, this is crazy talk. Get ready, right? Um, okay, here's an example. Um, this is a friend of mine called Aiton Hilton. Um, he's a HR tech guy, uh, sort of a recruiting guy uh, in the talent space. Um, he had a similar situation to a lot of us. We've all been there. He's looking for work. Um, how does he do that? Of course, the first thing he needs to do is to write a resume. But he did something really smart. Um, instead of crafting the document privately, he decided, you know what? I'm going to push this out publicly before it was finished. He very simple act, anybody could do it, everyone's got LinkedIn. He went onto his LinkedIn profile and just published a document with his CV on it and said, hey, this is my CV, um, I do this, this, and this, what do you think? Um, how could it improve? That was the ask. Um, and 
uh, according to Aiton, um, he uh, that post just went absolutely crazy. Um, he got something like three, four hundred comments on that particular post, something like five hundred thousand views, would you believe? Um, five hundred thousand people viewed his resume because he decided to shift from a private setting to a public space where he was able to say where and the question was, hey, help me out. What do you think is wrong with my CV? Um, now, this is an example in extremists because I think he his post did go viral and it was a kind of a, 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 a remarkable result of doing this. Um, but even if this post didn't have that degree of traction, whatever would be the case, it would still be significantly more people would have come across his CV by him putting it online in this way. Um, now, why is this kind of an interesting experiment? Why is it a positive? Um, a couple of things to think about. Um, firstly, there's much better market intelligence. Um, so the reason why you would kind of send your CV or resume out to somebody to verify or do some quality assurance is because you want to improve the document. Um, well, guess what? You probably don't want to speak to your friends to do that. Um, they are your friends. They love you. Um, that makes them very bad people to give you feedback um, because they're very unlikely to share with you the tough news that your CV is a piece of needs to it needs to be rewritten. So it's much better feedback always to get information from people that don't know you, that have no social stake, that might just be able to give you objective commentary as to what is right or wrong about the document. So market intelligence is one of the big advantages of going public. You're going to get better information. And if you're a job seeker with better information, you feed it back into your CV, you're going to end up with a better CV. Therefore, better competitive, increased competitive advantage compared to your competitors. Second reason why this is really useful, um, that you send subliminal signals. Um, why else would anybody write a CV? Uh, you don't do that because it's a fun thing to do. You do that because there is an objective to get a job. Um, Aiton very cleverly subliminally signaled to 500,000 people that he's on the market. But he did it without saying so. He did it in an implicit, subliminal way. Um, and that's always preferable when you're trying to market something. You don't want to go too hard and too obvious up front because people shy away from that. Um, people don't want to have the sort of pressure, uh, the obligation, if you like, to help someone who's looking for work. Maybe I can't help. I don't want to be the guy to say, listen, I can't help you. Um, Aiton didn't make that request from the audience. He just asked the question that everyone can answer. What do you think of my CV? You don't need to have a job to be, uh, so you don't need to have a job vacancy to be able to contribute to the conversation that he started. You just need to have a pair of eyes and have read a CV before and an opinion. And then you can contribute to that conversation. But at the same time, I've, you'll have it in your mind that this, this guy is looking for work. 500,000 people now know that. It's probably a useful thing if you're a job seeker. Um, third, unexpected consequence of doing things publicly. It's like really, really efficient to make connections once you do something like this. Um, if you're one of these people that is basically trying to build your network, build your connections, and by the way, everybody should be doing that all the time. It should be a, a habit uh, sort of, a, of anybody's professional life, I would say. But even more so when you're job seeking, this is something that is critically important. But you might find it's like difficult to add connections or to make new connections, uh, particularly when there doesn't seem to be any common ground uh, for that connection to happen. Well, by making things public like Aiton did, he created the common ground. Um, because guess what? All of those hundreds of people that commentated on his document, they entered that common ground and it became much easier for him to then connect with those people. Um, no need to spend huge amounts of time researching profiles and writing custom messages and doing all of that heavyweight amount of work. They came to commentate on his CV. And because of that, they've already committed to a certain degree to be able to, to, to want to connect uh, with this guy. Finally, it improves Aiton's discoverability. Um, this is the world, the interconnected world is uh, that we're all part of. We all have digital profiles. We all create 
digital exhaust. It makes sense basically to, as, to make as big a, a digital footprint as possible because it means that uh, recruiters, at least the smart recruiters that know how to do it, they're gonna wanna discover people through the social footprint. Um, and by making a print like this, it improves Aiton's discoverability for those recruiters that are looking for his type of skill set. So all of these things happened um, that make this like a really great move. Um, and what makes it even better is that it actually costs no more effort. Um, in fact, it might have cost less effort to do it publicly than it might have done to do it privately. Uh, so there's a very common theme uh, when you shift from private to public is that the effort level doesn't go up, but the ROI significantly goes up. Um, and it's part of the reason why we should really think about defaulting uh, to the public side of things. Okay, let's think about something else. Researching opportunities. Hands up how many people are researching opportunities right now. You're spending time on the internet. You're looking at companies. You're looking at in industries. You're trying to figure out who's in charge of what. Um, where is the investment going? What are the leading trends? All that type of wonderful stuff. Of course, you need to research the market. You need to be credible. You need to know what you're doing. Um, but again, have a think. Are those activities public or are those activities private? Um, I would say almost 100% of the time, these activities are private. It's you in front of a computer doing internet research. That's it. No one else knows that you're doing this research or indeed no one knows about the stuff you're finding out as you go. You're just storing it away somewhere. It's a one person type of journey. Again, um, let's have a think of what happens if you shift to public, um, what happens uh, in that circumstance. Let's look at this example. This is a, a, from a friend of mine called Guillaume Mauberge. Um, so Guillaume is a, he's an entrepreneur, so he's not actually looking for a job, but he's looking for something that actually is quite similar in terms of the mechanics of finding a job. He's trying to raise some money. Um, so he runs a, a tech platform. He's trying to raise uh, $20 million or whatnot. Um, and actually fundraising uh, for the people who've never done it, um, it typically is quite a private thing, particularly if you're doing it um, through VCs and what have you. It's exactly one of those things that no one knows about until you announce, hey, I've just raised my Series A round. And then everyone thinks, oh, wow, congratulations. Very similar mechanic to you know uh, that big reveal of when you've got a new job um, and people only know once you've got it. But anyway, Guillaume does it totally differently. I, he posted this about a week ago, uh, maybe even just a couple of days ago, and I saw it and I thought, you know what, I have to talk about this. Uh, instead of doing it privately, which almost every entrepreneur will do, he said, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to publicly interview founders that I know that have already raised $20 million. Um, I'm going to record those interviews. I'm going to share my learning and figure out how best to raise $20 million. And I'm also going to give you a behind the scenes look on the process method and, and, and what have you. He's basically putting himself out up there to say, you know what, if I either succeed or fail in this process, you're going to know about it because I'm going to show you, you know, the behind the scenes view of it. Um, anyway, I saw this and I thought, yeah, what a wonderful project. Very funny, but very valuable and very clever as well. Um, here's the reasons why. Number one, he is providing value to the industry as he's doing that. There are tons of entrepreneurs that don't know how to raise money. Neither does Guillaume, or at least that's what he's saying. He doesn't know how to do it, but he's going to share his learning as he goes. So imagine what you're doing when you're doing research on your market. Can you also share what you learn publicly to everyone else in the L&D space? They're going to love you for it because you're doing the work that they would also need to do. You accrue social capital by doing that. You're not just giving away that info for free, even though it might feel that way. What you're also doing is creating reciprocity from the rest of the industry because suddenly they're thinking, go on, Guillaume, this is great stuff. Secondly, once again, subliminal signaling. He never, Guillaume never emailed me to say, Hong, I'm looking to raise $20 million. Do you know of a VC that could help me with that? But I know about it. Um, the reason why I know about it is because he wrote a Facebook update and he sent it out there. Now think about how many emails he would have had to have sent uh, to, uh, to create that type of messaging if he did it explicitly. He would have had to have sent thousands of messages to people like me to say, Hong, do you know anybody who could help with this? Um, but with a very simple Facebook update, any kind of update in a public space, he started a conversation which hundreds and thousands of people have seen. And now we all know 
Guillaume is on the mission to raise $20 million. Do I know anybody that might help? Um, great subliminal signaling, fantastic marketing. Secondly, thirdly, you know this already, brilliant to make connections. All of these things are connected. We're starting to see if you do things publicly, uh, you become, uh, you accrue the social capital, uh, you get the subliminal message out, the ability to make connections becomes a lot easier. Um, and of course, you improve your discoverability. Of course you do. Everyone is viralizing this post right now. Um, so we all know that Guillaume is on this crazy mission to document his fundraise. Um, and he's now easily discoverable by doing all of this. Um, and there's no doubt VCs are now much more aware as to what he's doing now than they were before. Um, think about the psychological shift. He's no longer individually pitching to these VCs and asking for a favor, which typically you might do when you're looking for work. You're saying, hey, have you got a job? Or have you got an opportunity? Have you got some information for me, etc." You feel like a supplicant when you do that. Um, and guess what? There is a hierarchical, uh, you put yourself in a lower hierarchical position when you have, you, when you position it in that way, the other person can say no, or they can ignore you. Um, and you know, this is, this, this is no good for your morale, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, Guillaume didn't do that. What he's done is say, look, I'm doing this separate space. Do you want to check it out? And then people are checking it out. Um, and he's communicating that message in a totally different way. So we could directly apply a lot of this type of mechanism and process to the job search. You're researching the marketplace. Great. Why is that not public information? Tell us about your journey doing it. Tell us about what you find. Um, how many job opportunities are happening at your level uh, compared to how many job opportunities are happening at the level below? That's research anybody can do online, but it's fascinating to know for other people in the marketplace. Share it. Uh, share that information publicly in a public space. You will basically accrue the capital in terms of people knowing what you're doing. The subliminal messaging will be there. Making connections will be there increasing your discoverability will be there. Okay, networking. Um, I'm sure we've all been told, go and network. That's the way to get jobs, right? Um, let's go and network. Probably the most terrifying thing you've ever heard. I hate when someone says, oh, go and network. Um, it's like go and have fun type of thing. It's like very hard to suddenly switch on and think this is what you're gonna be doing. Um, and again, guess what? When you do things privately and you do things bilaterally, it becomes hard work. You send a message to somebody on LinkedIn that you know basically has uh, an opportunity or the ability to make decisions which start sort of, um, uh, which may lead to a job opportunity. And you're saying, hey, listen, can I get an informational interview? Can I, can, can I pick your brains for 20 minutes? Can I do those types of things? Usual answer, no answer. They're not interested. It's like literally a blank response because um, uh, you, you basically come in and made a request, which is difficult for this person to say yes to. Um, it's only 20 minutes for you, but this person probably gets loads of those requests, in which case those 20 minutes build up and they're, in, they're not in a position to make a particular decision, yes or no, unless there's some other reason, um, uh, sort of a, uh, some sort of previous uh, relationship you have with them uh, that will help them do that. So networking is terrible, um, particularly terrible when you do it privately and bilaterally. Um, what do you do when you go publicly? Um, I'm using this example, a friend of mine, Joe McCatty. She was a career coach, actually still is a career coach and also a recruiter as well over in Australia. Uh, she was in exactly the same position, looking for work, leaving a previous employer, wasn't quite sure direction of travel, etc. She knew that networking was key to what she needed to do to unlock those opportunities. You could apply for jobs all day uh, and all night, um, but it was a really tough market back then, still is a tough market. You apply for a job, you're going through the front door, it's going to be very difficult for you to get in just on a mathematical uh, sort of basis. So instead, she thought of the smart idea, you know what, I'm going to network with somebody, but instead of just doing this like one-to-one -one in a private way, why don't I get them on camera and do a quick interview with them and create a series where I'm basically doing a blog post or a, a video cast, if you like. This, I think, was a live stream um, and invite them to come and join me on this live stream to, to learn about uh, their career stories. I think the theme in this case, it, the theme isn't important, but I'll introduce it in any case. She was just interviewing uh, sort of successful entrepreneurs and just trying to figure out what their career path was. 
And you'd be surprised who is happy to go ahead and do that. You know, reasonably famous people in industry were happy to spend a bit of time with Joe uh, to get on camera and share their interest and their, their, their insight. Um, and and I, sus I suspect they wouldn't have done that if it was just like a private one-to-one -one meeting. Um, they were prepared to do it because it was a wider audience. Everyone cares about audience, especially entrepreneurs. They know the value of having a, a, a good market, a good sort of a, a bunch of people paying attention to what they're doing. Um, and it was an opportunity, I guess, um, to, to be a bit more public themselves. Okay, a couple of things that's valuable here. Number one, better conversion rate. Um, if you ask someone to pick their brains or you ask them for an information interview or a coffee meeting or whatever, your conversion rate goes and drops to the floor because you're just putting on work for other people to do. They're not going to do it. Um, when you suggest a third thing, like, hey, let's go and do a podcast. Let's, let's interview you. Let's do something of this type where you're producing a bit of content for the rest of the market or industry, your conversion rate can shoot up. Um, again, you accrue social capital by doing it. You're associating, by the way, with people who themselves might have a strong uh, presence in the market, um, and that's going to help you tremendously. Joe just peer appearing on screen with this guy, I forget his name, J James Telfer or whatever, um, that's going to help Joe um, because right now James is a more famous person in the space than Joe is, but they're on camera together. Other people are going to start thinking, you know what, there's some brand association thing going on there. Okay, more valuable contacts. As I mentioned before, you can go senior more effectively by using this method. Um, and again, we've heard this story before, improved discoverability. The person that you're, you're on screen with or the person you share some airtime with or whatever um, is likely themselves to have quite a significant digital footprint. Um, by connecting with themselves on the same digital asset, i.e. this video live stream that Joe is on, you're going to improve your own discoverability by doing that. Okay, bear in mind, no extra effort. Um, it was still only a 30-minute sort of conversation. It was literally no extra. Maybe a little bit more in terms of administrating it and setting up the system and what have you, but not, not anything you would say significantly more. Um, but the value, return to value, was tremendously increased. Okay, um, what happens when you go and actually discover an opportunity, you're through in the process, you're getting assessed on what you know and all this type of stuff. Of course, that has to be private. Of course, that is a bilateral process. You know, no one else is dropping in on your interview or no one else is coming in to you know, uh, publicly help you in, 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 a, in, in going through a technical exercise. Um, this is all true, um, but there are ways in which you could also shift the public what the assessment is. Remember, when recruiters assess you, they're looking for your competence and your skill set and your knowledge within a certain space. Now, they probably were going to try and discover that after they've decided that you're a, you're, you're a qualified person based on CV. But what if you kind of had that information out there online anyway? You got ahead of the assessment and you provided um, that intelligence for the recruiters and the hiring managers in advance of you even entering the recruiting process that's probably going to be a useful thing. Example on this, this is a GitHub profile. Um, for people who are not, not, not technical, GitHub is basically version control uh, for software devs. That's what it basically started off as. Um, but it's since over the last, uh, yes? I'm so sorry. Kicking me off. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Oh my God. It's so, it's so good. It's so hard to like find a point to like, um, to, to, to kick that off because it is it's it's such rich material, um, and the the conversation will most definitely continue in terms of public to private. So if you all don't know Hung, you guys got a glimpse of who this magical person is. So I invite you first to uh, get a hold of him, um, and remember that two way is limited. Go to also the recruiting brain food. Subscribe there. And we will continue that discussion. Cool. cool. Awesome. All right. No worries. Um, I, I'll be around, by the way. If anyone ha has, ha wants to have a chat with me about this, I'm happy to uh, to have take those questions. Go ahead, Liz. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. All right. See you over at Suzanne's. Mm -hmm.